Ladies and gentlemen, today we got the notorious Fleet Swan out of Los Angeles. Campaigning worldwide, right? Yes, sir. Start at the beginning. So, uh, what part of Los Angeles are you from? I'm from West Los Angeles, Venice, Culver City, and at the end, Santa Monica. And you were you were born in Los Angeles, or you were born? I was born in Culver City. But if you don't mind me asking, uh, what is your ethnicity? Oh, well, I don't want to get into too much detail, but I'm Central American. Understandable. So you said you grew up in Culver City in Venice, right? Yes, sir. What was that like back then? Well, um, I seen a lot of gang banging. Um, it was like growing up, going to Venice, you couldn't wear red. Going to Culver City, you couldn't wear blue. And at the time, it was when my graffiti career started, it was really dangerous to catch a bus really dangerous to walk on the street. Um, and everywhere in West LA, in the Palms area, it was just, uh, I would say growing up there was a beautiful thing, but at the same time, really dangerous. So did you grow up in Culver City or Venice? You said uh, you had to deal with- I, I grew up on Lincoln and Venice, mm -hmm. and then we moved to Sentinella, and I believe it was Braddock right at the mm. corner. So I was like- Oh, wow. Yeah, I was like maybe four blocks mm. from the Culver City Projects. But we were tied to Venice through my parents. My mom went to Venice High, not through gangbang shit. It's just, she went to Venice High, so we were in Culver City, but she wanted me to stay on that side. So your mom was born here? In this no, my mom actually migrated over here from But she had a history at uh, Venice High? Yes, sir. She got here, um, I think at 16, maybe. Wow. Yeah, she was an ESL student. That's yeah. interesting. Yes. How did, did she ever speak to you about her transition, the culture difference, or was it hard for her? Um, it was hard for her because She's a person that shines. So when you shine too much, regardless if you know English, Spanish, or you know, speak Spanish or know English, people don't take a liking to it. So I know that she had some difficulties through school because her energy is at a high frequency. So she has some issues with some, uh, you know, you know, in LA, it's black versus brown for whatever reason. And, you know, she had problems with some black people. She had problems with some uh, American Latin people. But, at, you know, at the end, she surpassed it and was basically, basically became an American citizen to better herself. And, you know, uh, the transition for her was uh, somewhat hard. And if you had to describe your childhood, what would you say, uh, what was it summed up? What was it like? Was it, was it stable? Was it unstable? I would say like, I was the only child. So it was always fun. And it stuck to me today because my life is fun. But there was nothing stable. No father and my mother was working, so. I was definitely, definitely left alone for a long time. What was the first element of uh, hip hop that you encountered? Definitely the music side. You know, late eighties music. On Remember the with the first song? NWA, heard? I would have to say, I took a liking to NWA. And my mom would take me to Target and I would go through the CD sections and NWA had the most at the best album cover that I took liking to. So I reciprocated to that and I was listening to West Coast hip hop. What was the first song you heard out of NWA? <laughs> that I can't remember. Probably was Fuck the Police or some stupid <laughs> shit like that, 
I was like listening to Two Life Crew and shit uh, as a little kid, you know, like just enjoying life. So, would you say you had heard of rock or other genres of music, Spanish music? So, why did hip hop it's, turn you out? Or it's did, funny you say why that. Why did you hit that? It, it's, I don't know. I think I just, right from the bat, I just gravitated to it. Like, it just sucked me in. Like, basically recruited me to the culture because my parents just listened to Spanish music and they dance merengue, cumbia, and they don't listen to hip hop, you know? I mean, they don't mind it, but they're Spanish, you know? And was, uh, were you raised uh, speaking both languages? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. Yeah. So. Definitely have to be bilingual. How'd you first <clears throat> encounter graffiti? My introduction to graffiti was my uncle. He was doing graffiti in 1990 and early 90s. So in 1993, I was of the age to where I paid attention. I, I knew what was going on. And I would go into his room and see pieces. I would um, always see him drawing. <clears throat> and a big, a big part of this whole movement of mine would be Beach Street. He let me see that movie and I was a b-boy, hip hop. So it was actually the movie Beach Street that just ignited your flame. Ignited it. There was no turning back. I was uh Well you were like I wanna be a part of this? Yes sir. Yes sir. I want to paint a subway one day. I want to go down to the subway and paint the tile. And this is like a dream that I, I seen it in this movie and I wanted to actually do it one day. So it wasn't even your uncle, it was the actual film. I would say my uncle sparked a little flame and Beach Street ignited it. So Beach Street had different aspects to it. So why was it the artistic painting side that <laughs> that got you? Because I can't dance. There were there were break dances. I can't dance and shit. I could two step, but I can't do no fucking crazy dance moves. <clears throat> and like I said, my uncle, since there was no stability, I would hang out with him a lot, and he was a big influence on graffiti. He could draw, he would do multicolored pieces, they would do characters in their books. And it's like, these elements of graffiti, I seen young. It wasn't just tagging on shit, like they were actually drawing beautiful pieces, colorful, just like Beach Street. Of course I seen Beach Street first, but then after seeing the movie, and seeing him do these things, it was like, wow, he does it. I could possibly do it. I really like this shit. That's dope. So some people, on the other hand, were introduced to it reverse, like the, the vandalism part. So you were actually took a liking to the artistic expression. Yes, sir. It, instead of like the fucking shit up, the ignorant yeah, vandalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I do, I do a lot of them fucking up and ignorant shit. Well, we, we can talk about that later. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like, like, <laughs> you're absolutely right. And it's cool to finally tell somebody the history of where I come from because people automatically think we're tigers. If you don't mind me uh, asking, if not, to just say otherwise, who was your uncle and what crew was he from? Oh yeah, my uncle was Jer. And he, J-U-R-E, and he would add a C-K, so it would be Jurek. And uh, he was from NHD. He was from a crew called 2R that I believe got created at University High School in West LA with selected few. And he was also from <clears throat> an old school crew in Mid-City um, by the name of MCA. And I believe Jimmer was from there. So he comes from like this, like, you know, 
Like, yeah, almost the start of, like a little after the start. He was a b-boy, for sure. Break dancer, just the coolest guy on the fucking planet, man. So, that's who he was, yeah. That's dope to have that type of mentor, because a lot of people don't come into the game with that type of mentor. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, so that's already a plus. Who'd you look up into the graffiti world besides him? Man, like... You know, I'm gonna keep it 100% and not, you know, include the people that I did look up to. And it was like, I was on the buses a lot. So one dude that stood out was Corell, K-O-R-E-L-E-R. -E -E he was just like, you know, I wouldn't go too far, but that was a big influence. The bus dudes, the CWs, you know, and then before that, it was um, really like on the art aspect of it. I would say CBS, definitely um, AWR. I remember seeing some PIE throw-ups in my alley, you know, like Jigs, big influence, you know. I seen them the other day and I gave them just flowers. But I would say, you know, uh, those crews at the time, I did not know people's names. I just seen like colorful bombs that I really thought was impeccable at the time. Yeah, Jigs is a big West Side legend. For sure. For people on the West Side. And my flowers to you, brother, forever. So why did you go the graffiti route as far as the bang? Cause you said banging was all around too, so. You could have easily gone this way or the other way, correct? Or no? Yeah, that is that is true. There was a point where I went to a middle school and like you had to get jumped to kick it somewhere. That was my first time like <clears throat> I wanted to kick it there. I got jumped and it was like kind of ignorant. I got jumped to hang out and then anybody who would come to the school, we would fight that didn't belong at the school. So after like, <clears throat> I would say two semesters of that, I got kicked out and went to another school and the opposite gang was there. And it was either I stay there or I fight for this gang that I'm not really a part of. So at that point, I made a decision. Do I gang bang for this fucking gang? Or do I just enjoy my time here as a graffiti writer? So I went through this game bang, fucking junior high shit. Sixth grade got kicked out, but seventh grade I transitioned to not wanting to gang bang, back to hip hop, to doing graffiti, and stealing forties and stealing streaks, and that's where that route once again ignited. That's pretty vicious. A lot of people don't understand that. Like outsiders looking in, like you said, it was either this way or that way. You know, they understand an aspect where there's always a, another choice. There's two other choices, maybe three other choices. So why did you, why did you state it like that for people that don't understand that it was either this way or that way? Or people that might not understand the pressure of dealing with a situation like that? Oh man, you know, like, it's just like, I get goosebumps thinking about it because it's like, at that point in time, you're barely becoming a man. And it's like, you want to prove to this person that you're a man. And then if you don't do what they want you to prove, you're kind of like singled out to being a bitch. So if you don't take this route, which the gangbang route, you're a bitch. And this was the code. And maybe still is. I'm not too sure about how that works because I'm not involved in that. But back then, that's what it was. You're going to fucking gangbang or you're going to be a little bitch and do some other shit. So that's why it's so much pressure and that's why I stayed it like that. Yeah, I just want someone from an outside perspective that has no idea into this world, uh, you know, because yeah, yeah. a lot of people don't understand. Yeah, gangbangers apply a lot of pressure, and if you're cool, 
they want you there, but then it gets, um, you know, it gets, it gets really, really filthy. You know, you have to put in that work. And that's something I would not sign up for in any way. No disrespect to anybody. It was just that I felt like I had a route. And, you know, if you derail the route, you might regret your life. So, as a young man, I was already aware of this for whatever reason. So you you never confided in it with anyone before? You could say you almost uh, instinctively knew it was like a survival thing? Yes, sir. You hit it right on the money. So how'd you first get started? Did you catch a spot? Did you catch a throw up? Do you even remember it? First I, I do. It's kind of embarrassing, but from watching my uncle, like we sat down on the curb and we were talking about it. And I, I don't know what the fuck I had to write with. And I wrote on some dude's truck. Went home and this guy came barking down to my fucking front door telling my mom that I wrote on this truck. It was like the stupidest thing I could have ever done now thinking of it, but I was super young. I, I will never forget that, but it was like, you know, long haired dude, hippie man coming to my house, fucking banging on the door like fucking police, just talking mad shit, man. <laughs> it's humor. Yeah, yeah, man, you're right. Like, I will never forget it. And what happened after that? Did you get whoop? Nah, nah, I got whooped for this. <laughs> when I really got in trouble, I wouldn't get whooped. I get whooped for like bullshit, you know? <laughs> I don't know why the word, world works like that, but that's just what happened. How did you progress out of just that little spot you just... My uncle didn't want to teach me. He wanted me to observe and earn it. It was kind of weird, like... You know, it was the way of the times. So it was like, you had to fight for yours. If you really want to do it, you're going to practice and practice and practice. And I would say like, I would see him fill markers up at my house. And he would take me to my little league games and he'll sit me two, two seats ahead of him, in front of him. And then I could smell the same paint that he was mixing at the house. And then I got up, we're getting off the bus, and then I look over, of course, you know, I want to see what the fuck's going on. And I see that there's a silver fucking tag right there. And from that day on, another time that ignited the flame where I had to find a marker, I had to find a spray can, I had to find some way to get, to express myself the way he was. So he was making his own markers back then. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, sir. Yeah, I believe people still do it, but it's not as common as it was back then. Well, I continue to do these things and I continue to shine heavier because of that. <laughs> what do you mean making, making well, I make your own? My, my, I make my own silver concoction and, um, you know, it stands out from wherever I catch a tag. It's like really shiny, really glossy, you know, like I like to stand out. Did you buy or gank your supplies? <laughs> oh man, what type of question is that, bro? If you ain't ganking your supplies, you're fucking a bitch, dog. <laughs> and this is, the, we're talking about the young me. You know, now I'm a little older, I'm not ganking nothing. I'm gonna pay $10 for my favorite marker. But this is when I started and this is like, as a child, you better be ganking your shit. Especially if you're under the age of 18, you better be ganking everything. Paper, markers, spray paint, whatever you can get your hands on, fucking gank that shit. <laughs> yeah, why, why was that a, a religious unwritten rule in, that, in the graph game that you had to gank your stuff? I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you where it came from. I can tell you once I got once I became part of the culture, it was an unwritten rule. And I met some dudes um, in Santa Monica. Like I used to gank everything, clothes, just everything. And then I met these guys in Santa Monica, um, 
by the crew, by the uh, it's an old school crew, it's H2C. I started ganking with one of those dudes, heavy. Like, he taught me how to walk out with um, boxes of Krylon in a backpack. And then that's when I realized that this is really a thing that is a part of our culture. You know, like, you have to gank. We're ganking scribers for our bus trip. We're ganking paint so we can paint. We're ganking streaks so we can streak. And it's like, we're spending our money on weed and stealing the rest. You know, it's like. So uh, another aspect is that a lot of people are the economic, um, economic circumstances. Oh, well, they can't. They can't buy their supplies. So did you have the ability to buy your supplies and just went to ganking because it was frowned upon to buy in them or? Yes. Yes. Oh. I had the ability to buy whatever the fuck I wanted. Once again, I'm blessed for that. I was the only kid. My pops is a hustler. My mom's is a hustler. So I had money. And I would say 90% of the people I was with did not have money. And out of, circus, out of the circumstances, uh, we would definitely get it. And then sometimes the money I had, I would pay for everybody to eat once we're done with our ganking mission. But it was definitely frowned upon. And we just seen it as, you know, fuck the system, fuck the government. We're gonna get our shit for free and we're gonna express ourselves. And what would you say to someone that told you, how would you feel if I came in to your establishment, <laughs> your house, your business, and stole something? My house? i will probably kill you. But my store? <laughs> um, uh, you know what? If I don't catch you and you like run out, I don't know how, how it works. If there's like an insurance thing, you know, it's like... Uh, I've been through it. I wouldn't accept it, but I wouldn't be a superhero. I wouldn't call the cops. I wouldn't kick your ass. I would just, just accept it. Like, fuck. I sell graffiti supplies. Graffiti writers came, stole. Like, what do you expect? You know? So you just touched on another aspect that, because uh, I recently went into a, a graph shop a while back and I was just surprised at all the things that they actually sell and cater to you and you had to make those devices or find them elsewhere you, you'd go to hardware stores do you see that this new age as being spoiled and, and they have access to these the electric scooters they have uber you know back in your day it was what it was a bus a pay phone. No it. Once the bus stops, you're walking home. And you're not communicating with anybody at the time. You know, <clears throat> so it was definitely rougher. Um, definitely more independent. You know, that's what taught us how to be independent. You got to get your ass home. So we're, we're 15 years old. And not stranded because we have our two feet. So we never played that victim shit. So wherever we're at, we got to get over there. And yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being spoiled. I'm not going to go that route. But they are spoiled. And it's a good thing. You know, I, I basically celebrate that for them because we kind of paved the way, paved the way for them. You know, if graffiti wasn't such a hot commodity, then all this stuff wouldn't exist. Like, you know, people are selling the plastic markers. You can get plastic markers on Amazon, fill it up with some fucking ink and go and do something. Like you said, I used to put silver inside of like, um, squeeze glue bottles. I would empty out the glue, put silver in it, and then have a little roller marker. And I would have to go steal all these fucking glue, uh, glue squeezes to fucking have a bunch of markers. You know, it was like, it was a thrill doing it, but like, there's nothing like going to the store and buying 
two streaks and three markers for like what twenty five dollars. So they are spoiled, but you know, I, I toast to that for them, you know. Not uh, just that, even on the caps, you would have to get creative, right? You yeah, have to. yeah, I don't know if you uh, remember back in the day, people are putting bigger holes in their fucking spray caps and putting plastic covers to make their their lines thinner. And like now you have uh, basically not to belittle anybody, but you have a cap that doesn't fall. You know, of course you still have to know how to apply the paint and use it, but I mean, with these tips, just keep buying them, keep practicing, you're gonna get it. Opposed to like not having that and trying to figure it out, it's gonna take a lot longer that way than the new way. Do you think that has fast forwarded the skill level of graffiti artists? Definitely. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. You know, some of my favorite writers are doing fat cap fills, you know, and a huge cap. You know, they're going from this big and it thins down to super thin. And they're doing all types of flares inside for their fill-in. And it's a beautiful thing to see, but without that fat cap, they wouldn't be able to do it. What uh, repercussions if any, have you ever faced over graffiti due to the law or the streets? Because the streets have their own rules and repercussions for doing stuff. You can find yourself in some pretty hairy situations out there. Doing this in Los Angeles, which is my background, is you find yourself in a lot of crazy situations. Yo, yo, this is the only thing I found. There was police where everywhere I went. Where are you at? The law really outlawed it and made it uh, a felony crime. So you're like going to prison for graffiti and the dude that's stealing or the dude that just hit somebody with something might get let go. And they're kind of treating you like graffiti is just the, like the holy grail of fucking scumbags, you know, like, like you're ruining the community. You know, I get it, but growing up in that time, it was really frowned upon and the police did not like that shit. Like they were handing out felonies if you get caught writing on a window with a mean streak. Mind you, you can shoot, spray with some alcohol, wipe it right off, and the problem is over with. But instead, they will hand you a felony. And you're going to take the felony because they're going to say, we'll give you a felony, but we'll release you in the morning, and that's it. Who's not going to take the felony? Now, like, speaking on the street rules and street aspect about it, there was a lot of situations where we're riding somewhere and like a carload of gangbangers pull up on us. They'll pull their guns, put their guns in our faces and our, on our chest and be like, what the fuck y'all doing? Y'all taggers? Y'all tagging in my neighborhood? And they'll snatch everything out your pockets. They'll fuck them. You're lucky if you don't get hit because that's the type of time they were on back then. We, I'm from West LA. Anytime we go to LA, I would say nine times out of 10, we would get into a fight. Some gangbangers would rob us. Uh, we've been shot at. <clears throat> so it was definitely a turning point when it came to the street law doing graffiti in Los Angeles back in the time that I was coming up in. Yeah, because a lot of people from different states, they don't understand that, or they they find it somewhat like crazy that people have to go through that, that were doing that. They don't understand why. If you could speak why 
that friction exists between writers and, and gangs. You know what? One guy told me that the reason they hate taggers is because they make their neighborhood hot. So once they write somewhere, the police comes, investigates it, and creates a scene. So in these neighborhoods, they want as little as um, they want as they want little. They don't want to burn the spot. Yeah, right? they don't want no attention. You know, no attention whatsoever. So I get that point. But then it's funny that you ask that because there's it's like oh, you know, I'm gonna speak on the shit. There's a lot of graffiti writers that I that started gang banging. I don't know if they were influenced. I don't know if they were rushed in their hood. But a lot of graffiti writers got into neighborhoods and they're the main ones screaming, fuck tigers. And I just never could understand that. Like, why would you do something like that? When you were a graffiti writer, you should go over there and speak up for us. But instead you went over there to belittle us and act tough. And you know, that's basically what I noticed a lot of. I can't speak on it as a whole, but I can speak from my experience and what I have seen with a lot of gangs and the reason, reasoning of their hate towards us was that. So someone from the outside regular world, you know, because this is, this is a very underground culture. Yes, yes. So someone from the outside world will ask, look at all these problems you go through to do this. Why do you do it? Why would you do it? Man, you know what? I would have to say how I feel now. There's, it's something worth doing it's like something you stand for you know and like back in the day you did not want to like surrender or retreat so you know like it's just really part of the culture in los angeles like you have to go through this let's say for instance you went out yesterday you got shot at sh shots missed you it was a close call. You go home, go to sleep, wake up, and you do the same shit again. It's because it's part of our culture. Somebody else would say, fuck that, I would never do this again. That was crazy. You guys go through this all the time? It's not all the time, but it happens often. And I would just say something worth standing up for. Like, I made it this far because I stuck to my guns. And um, you know, it, it really made who I am, it made what I am today. Someone <laughs> from the outside would say, those are some pretty insane uh, guns to stick to. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely say so, because the, the way I see it is like, look, you go home after all of this chaotic fucking messiness, and you don't tell your parents. None of this shit. You don't tell anybody this shit. The only people that know were the people that experienced it. But if you go and tell your mom what you just experienced and what you just seen, or tell any regular person this, they would definitely say you're a stupid motherfucker. What the fuck are you doing with your life? You get what I'm saying? And it's, I don't know. We still continue to do it and we still do it. You know, I mean, everything's changed for me. But I'm just saying back in the day on how, you know, like this was happening. It was very, very dangerous. You know, scary at some point. So I'm not going to lie. So let, if we could, let's go into the mind of you back then. So you, you had no fear of losing your life. You had no fear of legal repercussions. You had, you had no, um, you could almost say you didn't give a fuck. It was uh, on the contrary, mm -hmm. on the contrary for myself. I actually did care. I actually didn't want any problems. I actually just wanted to do art. But 
the influence led us to that point. You know, like there was definitely fear. Like I thought I was bad and then I had a fight. I was like, what do I got to fight for? Well, we have to fight these guys. I'm like, I don't want to fight. So you get pushed into the terror dome to fight. And I'm scared shitless. My legs are shaking. I'm like, I don't want to fight, bro. You know what I'm saying? Going into a fight like that, you're going to get beat up. You know, first three punches, I'm on the floor bleeding. I'm like, oh shit. I don't want none of that shit. But once again, that's part of the culture. So at that point, you just put your fear aside and work with the universe. You know, I've always attracted what I want and I believe in that. So I feel like, you know, my granny's prayers and my mom's prayers basically kept me alive. You could say it was like a do or die instinct that yes, you had out yeah, there. Yes, sir. That was definitely it's almost it. like a soldier going out into his first battlefield, his first platoon, and his first mission, and he's he's freezing up, but it's just something he has to do. That's exactly what it is. But a lot of people would walk away because you had the ability to walk away, right? So something must have had either your peers or the actual lifestyle of it you loved. I would say I loved the lifestyle. And like I said, I was free. I wasn't like, I didn't have to be home at a young age. So I met, I was 13 years old hanging out with 16 year olds. I was 14 year old, I was a 14 year old sleeping over people's house, my friends' houses, and we would be out all night. And it's just a fucking thrill, bro. I've never been out late night. These guys are breaking into cars. They're calling bitches to come kick it. They're tagging on shit. I'm in awe, but I know what it comes with. It's dangerous to be out here. And like you said, it is like a soldier on his first mission. The first night's cool, the second night's cool, and little by little, you're basically working up every day and getting used to it, used to it, used to it. Something bad might happen, you might fall back a few steps. A week later, you're back to where you left off. And I think that's just, you know, what consumes our life is that thrill, is the way of living. You're kind of free, like an outlaw, you know, like you're doing whatever the fuck you want. There's no parents. You know, it's just like, really the thrill. As a youngster, it's like, why would you stay home? <laughs> and most can't comprehend that because you're over there fucking around. You know, but this culture is not for the people that don't understand. You get what I'm saying? Like, So going back to this freedom that you say you indulged in, you didn't have to be home. Where, where was your where was your mom at this time, if you don't mind me asking? Which my, my mom, you know what? My mom was working, man. I'm not. I don't blame anybody for shit. So let's get that shit straight. My mom was working to put food on the fucking table, working her ass off, catching a bus from who knows how fucking far to get back home to fucking put her feet up and rest. The last thing she wants to do is worry about anybody else. Of course she's worried about me, but you know, that's just every uh, middle class person's and lower class story. Parents gotta work. You know, you could say someone would look at this and say, uh, <clears throat> you might be addicted to the adrenaline that you're getting from uh, engaging in these acts. Definitely. Would, would you say, I would say there's, a, there's a high to it? Yes, sir. There's definitely a high to it. And would you say you're addicted to it? Um. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would definitely say I'm addicted to it, but it's more, instead of like, of calling it an addiction, because addiction is like a negative term, I would say more of what we love to do. You know, it's like you love doing something, so you do it. I, I guess it's the same as addiction, but I just think addiction is a negative term 
for what we love to do. You know, because addicts and drug use, it kind of goes to that. The terminology usually goes to that route. So I would say that we love the adrenaline, so we go and chase what we love. Yeah, but you could be addicted to many things. So you oh, might definitely. be addicted. You could be addicted to soap operas. You could be addicted to yeah. sugar. You could be yeah, addicted yeah. to s salts. I, I, I totally agree. It's just the term is derived from a negative place. But yeah, we are addicted. I, I want to get out of the fucking car and fucking blast some shit broad daylight and fucking have these cars passing by. And I don't give a fuck. It feels good not to give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna fucking drive up the street and do that shit again. I'll do it maybe four to five times in a fucking hour and a half. And all of a sudden the rush is over, you know?